Joining us now is uh, someone very special and dear to my heart, a friend as well as a brilliant Ph.D., Dr. Walter Longo from the University of Southern California at Los Angeles. Dr. Longo is an associate professor of gerontology and biological sciences. Walter, welcome to the show. What's it worth? Thanks. Uh, Walter, we broadcast at WMUZ to a Christian audience. The uh, anticipated total coverage is about 6 million people in southeastern Michigan, and I'm hoping that those that are tuning in tonight on Christmas Eve Eve are going to come away from the show uh, with an unbelievable amount of optimism and hope uh, when they hear about your breakthrough and how chemotherapy can now be infused into cancer patients uh, without the excruciating uh, pain and sometimes deadly side effects of chemotherapy. It really does sound too good to be true, but in this case, your clinical trials seem to prove that it's not only possible, but in the official animal tests that you've done, the results are astounding. In a nutshell, chemotherapy, if I'm not mistaken, is, uh, for lack of a better term, engineered to attack rapidly divisive cells. And of course, cancer divides rapidly, but chemotherapy also attacks and destroys healthy mammalian cells in the body, cells especially in the mouth, the thorax, the stomach, because they too are very active and divide uh, very quickly. And so, I guess chemotherapy does not differentiate between healthy cells that need to be uh, left alone and the deadly cancer cells. Uh, what have you done, what has your uh, science done to, for lack of a better word, trick the chemotherapy into attacking exclusively cancer cells? Yes. <clears throat> First of all, uh, um, I think we should differentiate between uh, preclinical studies and clinical studies, and uh, um, and so we are we have started a, um, a clinical trial at USC, but I should point out that we do not uh, have uh, clinical trial results yet uh, on fasting and chemotherapy. Um, with that said, um, the uh, the science and the uh, preclinical work in animals uh, is basically showing that uh, if you fast a um, an organism. The fasting will uh, basically uh, uh, turn on a protective shield, uh, uh, turn on a switch that protects the normal cells uh, from from all kinds of toxins. Uh, chemotherapy just happens to be the one we uh, give to cancer patients, but uh, really it would be a, a, a wide variety of toxins. And the and the reason for that is that in times of famine. Uh, the cells need to basically stop dividing. The normal cells need to stop dividing or, or minimize division and become uh, uh, sort of uh, going into a standby mode. In that standby mode, also has to be a highly protected mode because uh, um, the cells want to want to stay healthy and alive for as long as possible. Uh, the cancer cells, instead, by definition, they do not respond to. Uh, these orders, and uh, I think we had the advantage of having uh, background, some background in the cancer field, but most background in the aging field where protection was our, was our, uh, the focus. Uh, cancer oncologists were not really thinking about uh, protection of normal cells. It's not something that they do. They were just all focusing on how do I kill a cancer cell, uh, a cancer cell better? How, how do I get better at killing cancer cells? And I think maybe um, some of the answer or, or, or maybe a better way to go is to understand both the uh, normal and the cancer cells. So rather than take uh, a, a position, whereas cancer researchers are always looking for ways to attack cancer, you, by being a gerontologist, are involved in the, the study of how cells protect themselves when they age, and you noticed an opportunity then to say as cells are protecting themselves from different things like, like you said, famine or uh, many chemical uh, impurities and such, in noticing that fasting caused, caused cells to develop this protective nature, you then really kind of backed into the, uh, the discovery that in a fasting mode, these cells now are conserving their energy and therefore are building up protective mechanisms of things like chemotherapy. Is it, would that be a, a good summation? Yes, yes. And in fact, uh, this comes, uh, since this is a Christian uh, station, the, um, this comes from a, a friend of mine, a researcher, was at the, the, many years ago was at Children's Hospital, uh, not many years ago, uh, late 90s, 
and here in Los Angeles, and uh, and she will always accuse me. It's like, well, you're worrying about people living forever and you know extending human lifespan. What about uh, the children that have cancer? And uh, and so for the longest time, I just had this thing in my mind. And then uh, I think that uh, when uh, I uh, I thought about how uh, we can use the aging research even for children, uh, um, something like uh, cancer in children, and, th- and that was uh, about five years ago. That's when I uh, I, uh, I thought that well, this is it. You know, this is a way that we can make a tremendous difference uh, to even uh, uh, cancer in a child. Well, it's interesting that you bring up uh, uh, bi- biblical uh, tie-ins. The, it, I think it's pretty well known that Passover, for example, uh, when blood was put on the doors uh, to instruct the angel of death not to uh, kill anybody who had done that, uh, and instead the, uh, the firstborn were killed of the Egyptians. This was an uh, opportunity where there was a, a Passover situation. So in essence, by lulling the body into a, let's say, temporary fasting mode, the chemo basically passes over the healthy cells and instead attacks the cancer. Does that really have anything to do because the, the genetic information in the body is talking to itself but really has no tie to the cancer? Does that apply at all? Why? why d- yes, I, I think, you know, the religious one is a good analogy. And, um, and, uh, and yes, the cancer cells, I mean, everybody, I think, focused on uh, and, and, and more so now, if you go to oncology meetings, uh, they, they're, they're starting to talk about boutique um, uh, research, and meaning that uh, the idea now is to go to every single cancer and, 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 and try to attack it as an individual cancer, right? Right. And of course, great. I mean, you know, one day we might be able to attack every cancer individually. But uh, that's a very hard way to go. Imagine if we had to attack every bacteria individually. So if somebody comes in with an infection, we'd have to first find out what bacteria they have, and then we give them antibiotics, and we would be in a lot of trouble, right? And that's uh, after 100 years of, of doing research in the field. So I think that the cancer cells are disobedient. Uh, they don't care about the order, or they, they care very little about orders uh, coming from fasting. Um, and the normal cells instead are very much obedient. They've been doing it for for uh, billions of years, you know, billions of years. This is something that goes back to uh, bacteria. It's not uh, a human invention. Um, you know, if, if a bacteria starves, it will go into a uh, non-dividing protective mode. Uh, same thing for for fungi and, 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 and about every organism that you can think of. So, um, so then the, I think at least a, a very way, a different way to go from what everybody else is doing is to uh, focus on disobedience and, uh, and, and, and really say um, anybody that, that uh, will give an order and, uh, and, and anybody that disobeys this order is going to be in trouble. Walter, I, I would like to uh, talk very uh, quickly about the opportunity you had to inject mice with up to 10 times the dose of chemotherapy that would kill a human being. We're talking about a mouse that I don't know, maybe is a thousand times smaller. So to actually inject a mouse with 10 times what would kill a human is just an outrageous uh, attempt on seeing just how much protection starvation can give. If, If I'm not mistaken, you took a group of mice and split them down the middle, fed some mice, maybe 50, and then the other 50 you you stopped feeding them for about two days. If I'm not mistaken, it was uh, of the 50, 65% of the mice that were eating died instantly with an injection of 10 times the lethal dose. But in the fasting mice, only 1% died. That's a 65 time uh, greater death rate for eating mice. I think in the at least in the animal model, you've proven that there is an an extraordinary amount of protection that the body will get uh, by fasting. Yes, yes, uh, um, and I mean you know we're uh, this is a mouse uh, and and, uh, and so we need to uh, to see what's happening in uh, in people, and we've been following a number of people, and you know things look good, but. Uh, I think it's uh, very ambitious to think that we're going to be able to protect humans.